Hello, everyone. Hello. Um, my name is Akanksha, and I am the content marketing manager here at Delta Q Technologies, part of the Zappi group of companies. Um, I'd like to welcome you to this session. Please remember uh, that the session is going to be recorded and will be available to watch on demand following this session. If you have any questions during the session, please add them to uh, the Q&A tab, which you will, you will see at the top right of your screen. Note that your questions will be sent privately. And uh, with that, I would like to now uh, introduce our speakers for this session. Uh, I'd like to welcome Antonio from IDNIO and Alessandro from Delta Q. I will be passing it on to them to introduce themselves and begin the presentation. Thank you. Thanks, Akansha, and thanks everyone to join our, uh, our call. My name is Alessandro Roveda. I'm a Delta Q sales application engineer, and I can uh, guide you through uh, this presentation uh, focusing on the charger aspects. Okay. Um, hello to everybody. Thanks, Akanska and Alessandro. And thanks for the audience. Again, my name is Antonio Wifuyeda. I am technical manager of IDNEO. IDNEO is a company, an engineering company uh, with three business units, mobility, medtech, and industrial. I am technical manager of industrial. We provide engineering services of product, electronic product design from concept to manufacturing. And in the frame of these uh, products, one of the uh, IDNEO products that we have just raising, it's a battery management system. And this is the target, uh, the collaboration of this battery management system with the Q chargers is the target of this, uh, this presentation today. Okay. So uh, let me just proceed with the presentation. Uh, this is the outline of the presentation. Uh, we will focus on uh, the operation of automated gated vehicles or MARs, autonomous mobile robots, on a warehouse or manufacturing plant. Okay. And we will identify uh, what is the problem that they, they have to face with that. And what is the, the, the main problematic thing with the BMS, the batteries, the charges, et cetera, and what can we do? Okay. Then the second point, we will talk about autonomous charging because these machines just move autonomously and they go to charging in an autonomous way and, and go to work in an autonomous way review the charging strategies. And then I will start speaking about the role of the BMS in the warehouse performance. Why the BMS and the algorithms and uh, it's critical on the whole system. So we are not thinking and looking at the BMS and the charter as a uh, unitary elements. We are uh, evaluating what is the impact of those elements on the performance of the final solution. I will review, I will link this uh, with a uh, Quick review of the algorithms estimating the state of charge, the state of health of the batteries, which is a key parameter of performance. And then I would propose to the audience, uh, well, maybe some ideas about the, what could be the future collaboration between Charter and the BMS. Okay. And on the presentation, uh, I will may ask some questions, and then Akanska will uh, just raise some polls. Uh, so feel free uh, to answer, and we will be uh, we will appreciate your your answers on, on that. Okay, so let's talk about uh, the automaticated vehicles or autonomous moving robots. Uh, what is the difference between them among them? Automaticated vehicles they just do a specific uh, action, and they autonomously they work. Aut autonomous moving robots are uh, uh, moving along the warehouse, okay, uh, whatever they want. In AGB, the robot is moving always in the same direction, in the, with the same route, with the same track, and doing exactly always the same things in an autonomous way. But it has not taken decision, I'm going to go to this place or to the other place first. Okay. The point is, uh, we have evaluated and we have realized that autom autom automated gated vehicles is growing. And the forecast is about uh, more than 260,000 uh, units by uh, next year. It is large amount. It's ha it's having among uh, the ro robots uh, world, uh, world okay? logistic robots is the most demanded application. Okay, but then uh, we were curious. What is the most uh, the feature that is most requested on an autonomous robot? And then we have found some uh, polls and questionnaires around the internet with some consultancy companies. Okay. And the two main points here, at first, uh, the durability, reliability of the robot, okay? 
and then the service response time. So it means they have to uh, work uh, all the time and they have to work reliably. So if there's some maintenance and they stop in the middle of the plant or whatever, this is a big problem. So among all the questions here that it's about, uh, I think it was, well, the source was uh, PRS Research Group, okay, that was the research of this, uh, this poll, okay. I think tens of companies uh, were asked for that, and re uh, nearly 90% uh, answered that the reliability of the robot is the most most uh, demanded feature and requested. Okay, so uh, let me just explain about how it how this works. No, in a warehouse, in a plant, in a big room, whatever, there is an inlet or a door in which the robot just get inside, and an outlet or robot in which they just get outside. Okay, inside, uh, depending of whether whether if it's AGV or a AMR, okay, the robot can have just a well-defined track, or it moves randomly among them. But in any case, it will find some um, storage stations or some working stations along them, and on each station, the robot can just pick up packets or deliver packets. Okay, so it's both of them can do both of them and. Eventually, in the middle of the plan, you can find uh, some charging stations, okay? So the point is that the robot is moved around, just picking packets, delivering packets, picking packets, delivering packets, moving from here to here, getting the inlet and the outlet, okay? And at some point, the robot decides, okay, uh, my battery life will go off in before uh, the next uh, job is finished. So uh, the robot goes to the charging stations and then get charged and then both backs to, to work in, to the job again, okay? Here, uh, the most interesting thing of the performance, it's uh, the number of trips, of loaded trips, trips that the robot makes up with loaded, with a lot of packets, okay? Versus the number of empty trips, okay? What we want is that the number of trips with loaded trips, it's mostly 100, uh, almost 100% of the time, okay? Or we can measure uh, uh, again the number of pickups versus the number of dropouts. Okay, and this is how the uh, uh, warehouse measures the performance. Okay, this means that if a robot is stop doing nothing, performance it's it's very bad. You no, know? and if a robot is just moving thousands of packets every day, the performance is perfect. It's fantastic. So, what are the key parameters that define the performance? First of all, the fleet size, number of robots that are working. It's not the same having well, just one robot that 15 working simultaneously, okay? If we make it too large, instead of 15, we make 50 or 200 robots, maybe this is not efficient because the, uh, most of them are uh, doing empty trips. So, okay, and the robot is expensive, okay? So this is, uh, the blitz size is a key parameter. Another key parameter is the number of charging stations. Why? Because, uh, Let's assume that we have 50 robots moving around. If we have just one charging station, maybe there is a queue of robots waiting for uh, to be charged. This means robots that are stopped doing nothing, so the performance is it's uh, it's lower. No, that's a key point. And then the third point is the charging strategy. We want that the robot is not stop charging battery. We want that the robot is outside working, moving packets. So. It's desirable that the robot uh, uh, spends 1% of the time charging and 99% of the time moving packets. But this is not possible. We know that the char charging time it's, it could take a long time. So the charging strategy is also a key parameter. Okay. So what can we do? We can add a new robot, AGV. We can optimize the facility layout, which means to, to define what are the, the drags on the routes of the robots that we may do in a synchronized way to optimize the performance, uh, or we can improve the utilization of the AGVs, okay? Which is also improved, it's related with the <clears throat> optimization of the charging strategy, okay. So, so uh, let's talk about then about the charging strategy. We have two alternatives, battery swapping and opportunity charging. Battery swapping, uh, what does it mean? It's manual exchange. Of the battery, so it just a person just okay. takes the robot, removes the battery, and just put a new one there. 
uh, availability. Okay, swapping, it's about three minutes, three minutes of time. So the battery charge, it's about three minutes. In this sense, if the battery lifetime, it's eight hours, spending three minutes of battery swapping every eight hours seems very efficient, no? <laughs> that could be, okay? Uh, battery cost. We know that uh, the battery cost could be less, uh, could lead to a best, a less battery efficiency. Okay, because uh, automatic battery exchange could be expensive in this line. Okay, uh, we do, do we have a battery backup? Yes, we need it. We need a lot of batteries as backup and uh, for replacement. Okay, in this in this line. And do we need some personal uh, costs, some labor costs? Yes, because we need a person that remove and change the battery and we have to pay for this person as well. Okay. And do we need charging a station? No, it's not required. Opportunity charging. This means that the robot just takes the opportunity of going to charge uh, in when it detects that the battery is going up. Okay. Uh, the target is the availability of the robot. The charging takes at most 10% of the working time. This is target. Okay, this is mostly what it has been proved that can be done with Leon batteries. Okay, uh, the battery cost. Okay, uh, we know that rechargeable batteries are a bit more expensive than the non-rechargeable batteries. Okay, this is not. But again, do we need battery backup? No, it's not required. But this we don't need a battery backup for all the robots all the time. We need some backup maybe for some uh, eventual event. Okay, so this this goes to goes to a cheaper uh, thing and less um, spice required for the battery uh, storage, okay? Labor cost, we avoid it, it's not needed. We just need for maintenance and the, and one, but one of the targets is that the maintenance is reduced to be completely autonomous, though, so there's no labor, okay? And charging station, yes, we need that charging station, okay? But then we have some key points of con to consider that I will just pass the word to Alessandro to explain to explain about these uh, the key points to consider, uh, we, uh, again, uh, Akanska will just raise a, a poll here of what is your preferred method of battery uh, strategy. So feel free, please. Uh, I will I will appreciate the answer. So Alessandro, uh, please proceed to, as you will with the key points to consider on battery strategies. Thanks, Antonio. Thank you very much. So the key points that needs to be considered for the charging process uh, are the timing of the charging process. A possible question here or doubt can be when a customer has to perform the recharge process, the customer or the AGV. This uh, is strongly impacting on the system overall productivity of the system. Uh, performing uh, or sending, say, the robot at the right time at the charging station is uh, something crucial. The fast charge, this is a need uh, where the communication between the charger and the BMS is one of the key points. So having a charger and the battery and the BMS fully integrated with the charger doing exactly what the BMS is requiring is uh, extremely important. Another important point is the choice of the proper charging station. Which type of charging station, what power level? So those are questions that are impacting on the system power management and also possible on the phases balancing. Very important to consider. Duration of the charging process, another key point. This is generically a customer requirements and generically the shorter the battery it is. So in this case, very important to have a very powerful charger. Um, Delta Q is going into high power chargers. Uh, and for the moment we have uh, a very smart uh, system to manage the chargers in parallel to offer as much as possible uh, powerful charger or, cha or powerful solution to to our uh, to our customers okay yeah. here we thanks for ch uh, changing the slide so we go a little bit uh, on the autonomous charging machine um, uh, definition, uh, so let's uh, have a quick uh, overview of this. So a definition of the autonomous uh, charging can be that an autonomous machine, uh, such as driverless, uh, automatic or uh, robot forklift, can transport a lift, lower or put away and or retrieve loads without a human operator. 
what is uh, the autonomous charging? The autonomous charging allows a vehicle to charge without human interaction, and this is mandatory for uh, an autonomous machine. A fully autonomous machine, therefore, requires autonomous charging. Let's uh, quickly take a look on the tips regarding the autonomous charging. So I will just uh, briefly mention those three points, and tomorrow I invite everyone to come to the next session where I will be pre present with my colleague Hendrik, where we will go deeper in detail on those points, but uh, I will start to give you an, uh, a generic overview of, the, of those three points. So um, what are those tips for the moment? Uh, uh, so a customer um, or the charger um, must, needs to better than must, compensate for dirty charge contacts. This is crucial. Uh, having a charger able to automatically compensate or detect dirty contacts is fundamental, I would say, for properly charging the battery at the right target voltage, providing the right current. This is a feature that the Delta Q chargers are able to, to do. So the Delta Q chargers are able to compensate automatically for dirty contacts without the needs for a an operator or uh, a user uh, to uh, manually trick uh, uh, or uh, change the settings of the charge. Another tips uh, is that the charger and the battery should be able to communicate with each other at, outside of the two wires present on the system. Generically speaking, uh, with AGV robots, um, there are only two wires, okay? Um, this is something um, uh, important to consider them and um, unfortunately uh, having a possibility or system with three wires or uh, separate router for instance can get expensive and there could be also interference and takes up space in the robot or in the in the machine uh, delta q solution is uh, um, or better has delta q has um, implemented a technique to talk over the two power lines to charge and to talk between the BMS and, and the battery at the same time. So very important. Last tip is that the charger should recognize when a robot or a battery is not present and turn off the open spring loaded contacts to prevent safety hazard. This is crucial and this is very important for the people and for the machine safety. Without this functionality, incidents may happen, for instance, uh, short circuit may happen, uh, even in uh, unmanned uh, warehouses where uh, the, um, uh, the power lines uh, absolutely needs to be uh, off when the AGV and the chargers are not connected together. So we got our response our poll um, and the method that got the most number of votes was for opportunity charging. Great. Great. Thank you, Kanska. So um, let's talk about batteries. We are talking about robots. We are talking about charging. Let's talk about batteries. By the way, Kanska will also uh, raise the question along this slide the explanation. Uh, so what is your preferred battery type? Okay. But in general, we have several types of battery and several chemicals. We have NNC, we have uh, LFP, lithium ion, etc. And with different performance in terms of cost or the energy efficiency, which is the amount of energy uh, concentrated in a per kilogram okay, of the battery or per uh, volume of the battery. Okay, We can talk about safety, whether the, uh, the safety limits to keep the battery safe are, are <clears throat> Uh, wide limits or very stringent limits. So the, what is the risk of the battery that, that can make in particular, the performance, the specific power that can give, etc. Okay. In general, in what we have seen uh, since we are working on battery management systems in Indeo, is that the, in the warehouse, in the new one, the new applications of the warehouse, the logistic robots, are mostly uh, targeting uh, lithium ferrophosphate batteries, LFP. And the key point is that uh, the number of cycles of the, the charging, discharging uh, cycles of this battery is very large until the battery just uh, reduces the performance up to about 80% of the original performance of the original capacity. 
is much more larger than that. So if we measure the battery performance, the throughput, not just the depth of discharge itself, but the depth of the discharge with deficiency, but considering again, again the life cycles, which is the number of cycles charging, discharging, okay, the cheapest battery is the LFP, lithium photophosphate. It's not the one having the the, the best uh, if, um, concentration of uh, energy per kilogram. Yes. Not the best one in this size, okay. But considering the lifetime uh, price uh, of the energy, it's the best one. And this is one of the key points that uh, the people decide to use uh, LFP batteries. Okay. This is one of them. The second one, it's at 6,000 cycles, means that you can use the same battery along three years, which is, as I mentioned at the beginning, one of the uh, wishes of all warehouses. No maintenance, just one standard robot that during three years or during two years, I don't want to, uh, don't want to just do any kind of maintenance. No? So, so that's a key point. But then we have the drawback. It is the error sources that we have on the state of charge estimations. We have two error sources. First of all, if we need to create a current, mm, just considering the Coulomb counting, I mean, considering just uh, integrating the current that getting inside the battery during charging and the, uh, the current getting outside the battery while discharging, okay? It's not possible to do this measurement without any B bias current. It's impossible, even if it's one nanoampere. So a long time, this error is getting accumulated. Okay, so we have to to compensate that or to consider that this that, that this error exists. But the other error is the the sensi sensitivity of the voltage because we can measure again as well the state of charge just considering a table of the voltage the open circuit voltage of the battery against uh, the state of charge. Of course, this is for static uh, batteries uh, batteries that are just uh, uh, with no activity and they are active charging discharging this table this curves are diff a bit different one, but using, I will explain next slide, uh, complex algorithm, we can compensate that. But the, the, the key problem that we have with LFP batteries is that this curve, it's very flat. So this means very small uh, voltage error, one millivolt or five millivolts, can change the state of charge estimation based on the voltage, okay, in maybe 20%. So they ha we have these two, sources of that uh, of error. One of them is not related to the gamut, to the lithium photophosphate battery, but the other, the voltage sensitivity, given the flat response of the open circuit voltage versus the state of charge, it is, okay? So uh, I would like to know, Akanska, do you, do you have some answer about the, the ball? What is the preferred battery uh, type uh, in the audience? Yes, so for the pr preferred battery type, about 40% of the poll um, attendees said LFP, and then 32% said NMC, and then 28% said other. Okay. Perfect, nice. Thank you very much for your answers. Very appreciated. Antonio, I, per I personally voted NMC because I like NMC chemistry. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you, Alessandro. <laughs> no problem. Okay, then let's go to the state of charge uh, strategies and techniques that we can have from the battery management system. Um, okay, yeah, at this point, we have several algorithms. Okay, we can do many things. The, 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 the simplest one, okay, it's uh, Coulomb counting or uh, no, lookup table. Lookup table means to go to look at the, at the, at the open circuit voltage versus the state of charge. Yes, just Lead the lead uh, the battery without activity during thirty minutes, and then after thirty minutes of uh, no activity, you can just read the voltage, and then you can have a dimly grade state of charge estimation. Is it this practical? No, <laughs> no, for several reasons. First of all, in in an application as this one, uh, nobody wants to wait thirty minutes before <laughs> doing reading the state of charge. The robot must be working on. Okay. Yeah. We we cannot. I mean, it's this is the robot has to be moving packets, not waiting for uh, an information of the state of charge. And second is that this uh, the track battery degradation, the the curve of open circuit voltage versus uh, the state of charge changes again with the state of health of the battery. 
with the number of cycles, uh, charge discharge cycles. So just the lookup table is not practical. We need more smarter algorithms. It is true that uh, accurate measurements or with accurate ca characterization, the estimation error of state of charge of uh, lookup table moves along three five percent. Okay, for that. Then we have Coulomb counting, which is, or as I explained, integrating the current that gets inside the battery while charging, integrating the current while it's getting inside while discharging, considering as well the temperature of the cells, just to consider what is the Coulombic efficiency, which is the amount of the current that it's translated, truly translated to stored energy. Okay. We have the drawback of the current measurement bias. And, and we have the, this drawback of the error accumulation, okay? And we need to uh, implement some smart algorithms to estimate the capacity, the total capacity of the battery uh, a long time, because the capacity is just removing with the degradation of the battery. Most traditional methods uh, right now on this type of VMSs and this type of battery uses a combination of lookup table and Coulomb counting. Okay, both of them taking the advantages of one or the other, okay, uh, to estimate the state of charge. These are the simplest method uh, in in a VMS that it's battery power and doesn't have uh, powerful uh, computing capabilities. Then it's the the simplest things is to do an integration and lookup table and merge both of them in some smart way. Okay, but then we have the next level. Next level, what is? state of servers or filter based. This means that we have some uh, some electrical circuit models of the battery that responds to the um, behavior and performance of the battery. Okay? And we can have very accurate, uh, doing some measurements in laboratory, we can uh, really uh, extract very accurate models, electrical models of each battery cell or battery type or, or whatever. And then what does they do at the filter base or a state of service? They just measure the voltage of the battery uh, while it's working, okay? And then apply the electrical circuit model to extract what is actually the voltage of the, uh, of the battery, and then goes to the lookup table, okay? And extract that. In addition, they also perform volume counting and perform some tracking. And the estimation of the, all these parameters, which are resistors, capacitors, or somehow by capacitors, depending if it's linear or non-linear, et cetera, they define the state of health of the battery as well. So there is also an online method, estimation methods, okay, to keep track of all these parameters along the charging and discharging. Okay? We can mention a lot of uh, algorithms based on whatever, what it's called the state of servers, uh, which assume and a static implementation of the of the electrical circuit models or filter weights, uh, Kalman filters, particle filter, and sent Kalman filters, which assume some statistic st stochastical processes. In there, there is some um, um, some errors in the measurements. Consider some errors in the measurements. Consider some dispersion. Okay, we have analyzed. Uh, all of these methods, or several of these methods, several of these algorithms, we are in Ineo. We are investigating actually uh, several strategies for a state of charge and implementing complex complex methods. And we are evaluating the performance of, of several algorithms of this type. Okay, and we have some results mm, from Ineo and also from uh, the uh, publication scientific community. Okay, there is a lot of that. So. Let's do, for example, I can I have mentioned the voltage drifts, voltage error, and uh, current bias. Okay, so in this graph, in the upper uh, upper graph here, just for, forget about the right side uh, measurement because this is the end of the simulation. Okay, let's consider what is the 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 trends of this all these curves. All these curves means they are comparing uh, up to eight different electrical circuit models with uh, the same algorithms, which is, uh, in, in this case, is an send Kahneman filter. It's uh, the most accurate algorithm that we have able, not considering the complexity. Just, just fucking see what is the best that we can do, okay? All of them, if we uh, put in the simulation a current read, all of them, the error gets accumulating a long time and keeps growing. 
it is true that the algorithm is very accurate, and this means that we can hold a, a relatively long time uh, with an accumulated error below 2%, true. But if we increase this time, not to 1,000, uh, 10,000 10, seconds, if we increase it, or minutes, if we increase it to uh, 1 million of seconds, this trend will be higher than that. And the same happens if we assume there is a voltage drift. When we measure the voltage, it's not possible to measure the voltage without a drift. There is, the same thing happens. We see that a long time, the error is going, it's getting accumulated. Doesn't matter what the model we use, the electrical model we use. So this means that we still need something else on our, not just the algorithm, which is, we need just some upper level uh, processing capabilities, okay, to compensate this at some point, because the target is, uh, that we want to charge the battery from 20% to 80%, uh, then charge the battery, then go into this charge up to 20%, then go to charging up to 80%, and along 3,000 cycles, never reach 100%, never reach 0%. So after 3,000 cycles, um, never know the true state of the battery. Cannot, you cannot measure the true state of the battery after 3,000 cycles. That's it. That's the target of the algorithm that we are investigating. Right now. Okay. So, um, and this is the, one of the problematics that we have, okay? That the error keeps increasing. And then we are looking and investigating some higher level algorithms that takes information from other way rather than reaching the 100%. Okay. And then we have... Uh, more complex algorithms, which is data driven, which is genetic algorithms, out, uh, artificial neural networks, artificial intelligence, etc. Okay, this uh, the complexity of processing all these algorithms in real time. It's really large. We are doing, we are investigating that just to understand what are the capabilities and the limitations. But the main problem, the main drawback that we have right now, that we need a really large amount of that data to validate them to consolidate the algorithm. So we, we really need a long training algorithms, okay? And it's difficult to find. So I don't know, Alessandro, uh, do you think, for example, given that we have identified these problems with the voltages and currents, do you think that the measurements that the charger can do during charging about current and voltages can help the, the state of charge estimation? I was going to to intervene, <laughs> Antonio, uh, exactly in this direction. So, um, and I was going, by the way, uh, to tell you the same the same question. So maybe we can uh, I can already start to 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 give you my my point of view. Um, Delta Q chargers. So I don't want to say that we we have the best possible charger in the world, but okay. Uh, I'm lucky because I'm hearing from many customers that our chargers are very appreciated because of the precision of the current control and, the and about the precision of the voltage control. Uh, this is, I believe, is something uh, that for a battery manufacturer or for a battery company is something extremely important. Uh, having a charger that uh, is able to properly control the current Having a charger that is able to properly control the, the output voltage is something fundamental that can also improve and uh, yeah improve the, the battery life. And uh, say, we treat well the cells that you have in your battery, and this is theoretically giving you an advantage on the, on the market and with all your customers. What do what you think, um, Antonio? Yeah. No, thank is you for something... answering me. Sorry? Yeah, you go, you go, you go. Okay, no, thank you. I appreciate the, the answer uh, because I'm very interesting and I'm thinking actually on uh, a collaboration between the charger and the and the, and the the BMS. So the, the BMS can take advantage of the measurements and metrics of the battery uh, of, the, of the charger and given that they are very accurate, just consider them as well to improve the, the, the algorithms in this line. The this is also another uh, another important point. So um, the charger and the BMS can also exchange information uh, on the communication side. So not only on the 
real current measurements, okay, or the real current uh, regulation, okay. Uh, the charger and the BMS can also share together the uh, objects can open or also gain anti 39 So all the values communicated by the charger uh, received by, by the BMS, okay, in terms of current and voltage, okay, to uh, implement those values as a, as a control loop. Okay, so the charger can tell to the to the battery, I'm charging the battery with X amount of uh, of uh, ampere. Okay, mm -hmm. the BMS can uh, interpret these these values and understand uh, if uh, there is any error in the measurements performed by the BMS or even by the charger. Why not? Okay, this uh, this uh, is uh, something that can be developed. Uh, that is developed by 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 the customers by by us, okay, and this is going in the direction of the cl closed control loop. In this way, again, the uh, charging process is is improved. Great, I think I think that there is a good opportunity, and this this answer gives me the opportunity to start talking about this, which is just this is just on the slide to show uh, to compare what are the, what is the situation of the charger. And the situation of the uh, the battery, the BMS. Okay, so in terms of operational conditions, the charger is in a static platform, and, and it's plugged. Okay, it's in the, yep. it has a large amount of power. The BMS, it's on the robot in a moving platform, and it's battery power. So the optimization of the power consumption, it's a key parameter on the BMS as well. Yeah. Our consumption is not relevant on the charger, but it is critical on the BMS. The real-time operation on the charger right now, the charging time could be, I don't know, one hour standard. Maybe it's not really, uh, really critical, the, the processing time. But in the BMS, for the estimation of the state of charge during discharge and during operation, it is critical. It has to implement a complex algorithm in real time. But we are the power consumption should be and the complexity should be controlled. So it's a challenge in this line. Okay. The computing capabilities, I think, in this line that you were just mentioning, Alessandro, uh, there is a potential growth on the charger because the capabilities of the BMSs in general is limited. Can be grow up, of course, can be grow up the capability, the computer, the, the computing capabilities of the BMS. Of course, it is possible, but it's limited by the uh, power consumption uh, limitation. In terms of storage capability, it's mostly the same. There's a potential growth on the, on the side of the charger, and it's a limitation on the side of the battery. Okay? And in terms of connectivity, uh, most BMSs right now uh, include, uh, they, all, they, they have cable communications, can, or, uh, can, normally can communications, but some of them, Again, with the, the in the battery management system, again, they have wireless connectivity. Uh, is this critical? Depending on the application, there are some robots in general that they already have a telematic control unit, so they don't really need that the battery just uh, reports the data through a wireless communication. Okay, uh, but in some applications, may, may, might be useful. But the the charger can have cable communications, Ethernet, which is much faster but also wireless. And it's easier to have cloud communication with the charger. Okay, So this leads me, what can, what can be done? In these lines, what I think is that uh, it makes sense that uh, to improve the charging capabilities with several units in parallel, as you, Alessandro, just mentioned before, Okay, yep. we can do uh, non-wireless charging, Okay, which is uh, enables also uh, data transfer uh, capabilities between the charger and the and the BMS, okay. And we can add uh, the redundant voltages measurements in there, or voltages or current, whatever you, you mentioned that we can do that, and we can do that with Delta Q chargers, okay. But in terms of data management, can what can we done? We can do complex algorithms that uh, extracts a large amount of data uh, of the batteries, which is the Assuming the electrical circuit models, complex ones with complex algorithms behind that, okay, we can just record data, extract some first level of processing, statistical processing, and when it is connected to the charger, just pass this data. 
and then the charger can can keep and can maintain a digital twin of the battery. Digital twin is uh, the electrical circuit model of exactly that battery with those parameters. Okay. Then in terms of computation, the complex computation, the BMS can do a first level processing given a very well fitted uh, model, but the extraction on online estimation of the parameters of this model can be done by the charter. It has a large amount of time. So it doesn't I mean, I don't, I don't say it doesn't matter the complexity. Of course, there is, there are some limitations. Okay. But there's still an opportunity growing in that time. Okay. Because if we go to real time operation, still is critical for the battery it has to be performed in real time. But, uh, in the charger side, we can, uh, doing some operation during charging, which is last period, last uh, period. And well, it can, we, we, we can relax the real time. We can do, we can work in near real time working in scripts uh, of data or batch of data. In terms of storage capability, uh, uh, BMS can store all the data related to, to one cycle data, one discharge or charge cycle data. But the key point is that the uh, battery, the charger can keep the data for thousands of cycles with a, with a, a static storage. This gives us the opportunity to implement a higher level algorithms, just looking at the metrics in, in all, in each charging, the charging cycle. Okay. Looking at the trends and, uh, uh, inferring some errors and just fixing them. So we can keep accuracy and measurements along 3000 cycles, because it can be detected that the trend is, the trend is going that, for example, let's assume that we underestimate uh, the, the charge of the battery, it can be detected that the time between the time to discharge under similar conditions or charge on the same conditions is lower. And it's getting lower every time, every cycle. And that does not, does not make sense. So we can just have higher level algorithms that just re-estimate the, the parameters to fix that. And in terms of connectivity, of course, the Delta, the Delta Q charted, they, they can have cloud connectivity and keep all this data in cloud. Okay. So, um, at this point, uh, what do you think, uh, Alessandro turning with, because in, we can implement can open. Do you think that is an opportunity with, uh, in can open to update it or to integrate the communication of all this data? Uh, this first level processing of the battery management system transferred to the charger during charging? Absolutely, yes. Uh, so at, at the moment, we also use cloud-based services. So basically, the charger sends uh, the data related to the charging to this external system, where in this external system, uh, where laptops or servers better can, can perform all the possible calculation. But maybe this is something we can also think uh, in, uh, in the future for our future projects. Why not uh, to have more powerful uh, memories or microprocessor inside the chargers? Why not? If the future is going in the direction, we can think about that, uh, where the charger starts already to store more uh, more and more data inside its memory where the user can uh, uh, pull the data from the charger once in a while okay basically the charger let's imagine we are referring to 3000 cycles uh, so the user automatically can uh, pull the data from the charger every thousand cycles 500 cycles whatever and can see already all the possible trends uh, related to current and voltage uh, during the charge cycles. For the moment, uh, the charger can, our actual chargers can, can uh, store up to 100 charge cycles. Okay. So the user up to now can already start to see something pretty, pretty, pretty interesting and pretty appreciated already right now. But in future, for, for sure, we can, uh, improve also from from this aspect and provide to to the customer uh, and a better service why not okay thank you alessandro so no problem. now uh, Akanska, i don't know if you want just to raise this question mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah 
Um, is there an opportunity for charger and BMS interaction to improve the warehouse performance based on autonomous charging and smart algorithms? We, um, before Antonio and Alessandro discuss about this, we would love for you all to submit your uh, comments or any questions that you have regarding any of the presentation um, through the Q&A tab on the top right. Um, and I'll pass it off to Alessandro and Antonio to start the discussion. Okay. So I, I don't know, I can, Alessandro, do you have some comment? If not, I... Uh, Ma yeah, maybe, maybe I can start uh, to give you my, my point of view, basically, in my opinion, this is, uh, this is a topic strictly related to improve the overall system productivity. The charger remote control related to the autonomous charging can ensure maximum freedom to, to the customers to properly organize the machine charging shift, for instance, to properly organize the system operation. Basically, having a charger that can be uh, remotely control uh, can offer maximum flex flexibility to organize the, the charge of the various components or system or devices that are in, in a network. And this uh, improves the charging, uh, the charging uh, status of all the robots, all the machine present in the system. And this in short to have uh, uh, longer uh, or uh, say uh, more of a robots during the shifts. I believe that this is also something that you as uh, in NEO, uh, in, I mean, you, you are looking for basically having a, an overall system uh, productivity increase, basically. Exactly. The point is for me, it's just let's focus the design of this uh, unit, charter of BMS, not as a unitary element to generalize just as a part of a bigger system to, to uh, optimize the performance of this bigger application. Yeah. And I just mentioned this part of the robot because I think it's a, the application I have met that uh, really suffers from this, this, this lack of uh, accuracy on the state of charge. And it is proven that uh, optimizing the charging time, okay, reducing it to I think one hour, depending on the application, but uh, optimizing the charging time versus the operational time, the a warehouse can just keep exactly the same performance with 30% uh, less of robots. So this is really an opportunity and ensuring that the, the end users uh, will be willing to pay for a solution for that. And if it's this, if this means that we can just share on the complexity between the charger and the and the BMS, the BMS. Uh, we can just help to solve this problem. And there are two, normally two units of the elements of the ecosystem that are not critical, not, not considered critical, but in my opinion, they can become critical if they work in a far way. <laughs> That's the key point. To Maybe me. One, uh, one of the key advantages, say, uh, if a customer uh, wants to, for instance, for, wants to select uh, a Delta Q charger and a, a, a BMS made, made by Neo is that we have already integrated the charger protocol. So uh, a user without effort can already have today a system battery charger fully integrated that is already working uh, perfectly together. And this obviously uh, uh, solve all the problems uh, that the customer may have for the integration of these two crucial components. Exactly. And I think here at this point, Alessandro, that we are aligned uh, because uh, on one side, uh, Delta Q chargers, the can open communication is quite flexible. So you can configure a lot of parameters to interchange with the BMS. It's quite flexible. But on the other side, the Neo BMS, uh, is provided with a firmware framework in which the end user can write their own algorithms on that. So it, we, it's open the firmware framework. We can help them to uh, for uh, to develop the specific state of charge or a state of health or uh, end user applications. But we can. Uh, but this is also open to the end user, so they can optimize that if they want. So this is, I think, that both products are uh, flexible enough to start allowing this transformation of these, these two units to a more complex 
uh, uh, units and more smart absolutely units. absolutely absolutely uh, it can also in my mind maybe something interesting uh, for uh, for the all the people that are listening to listening uh, that we we are working together since many years already many some years <laughs> <laughs> yes, uh, yes. and sometimes uh, it uh, it is already happened that um, we have uh, a common customer okay that is having his own uh, charge protocol or say communication protocol okay uh, the f flexibility between the charger and the bms ensure the win of the project because uh, the charger and the bms are, are already integrated okay and if the customer has specific needs with your open uh, say open uh, uh, protocol okay you can be very fast to integrate all the customer needs uh, the specific object object that the customer may need okay and this in in no time uh, uh, will uh, will grant the customer to have an overall system ready um, and designed according to to his specification. Yes, completely, fully agree. I I think we are totally aligned in this point. Uh, I can't say I'm not. I, it's there five ten minutes left, and I would like to if it's if the if the audience have just raised some questions or some comments, if it's possible to to know if there is some feedback opinion. Yeah. So there's a. Uh... There's only been one question that we have right now and just with time. So I think this is the only question we'd be able to um, answer is uh, what's the communication protocol between the charge and the BMS? And what would you say is the preferred communication protocol? And then a follow up was, um, should these communication protocols be standardized? Okay, I will let Alessandro to answer because it's based on Canopen and he's the uh, truly expert on Canopen. <laughs> He's probably the, the best person of the, on the of the world to answer the question. <laughs> Thanks, Antonio. Thanks, Antonio. So we we have worked together to integrate the charger, as as previously previously said, to integrate the charger and the BMS communication protocol. Right now, everything is is managed by Can Open Can Open Communication Standard Can Open 11 bits identifier. So very simple, but uh, provides already uh, a good amount of, of data, I would say. So a follow-up is, um, is the CAN communication between the charger and BMS defined in a standard or is it manufacturer specific? This is can open, uh, can open standard, uh, but we, we are open, we are open. Uh, and I believe also it now Antonio uh, is open yes. to integrate possible customer uh, specific uh, or proprietary communication. Exactly. And right. are there some standardized parts as part of the manufacturer, manufacturer specific portions or no? Sorry, can, can you repeat so, that? Sure. Um, so the question as a follow-up was, if there are manufacturer specific uh, protocols, is there some standardized parts to that? Uh, maybe this is more, more, uh, more related to Antonio. Uh, what you, what you think? Um, but generically, I, sometimes customer, uh, sometimes customer are having their specific uh, protocol, say proprietary protocols. Yes. Uh, I believe it neo BMS is, uh, are are able to uh, to quickly adapt their their communication protocol versus the customer system, uh, a VCU or uh, a system intelligence. Uh, we can say exactly. The point, the, the, the Neo BMS can work with CAN communications, then can open goes over CAN, can work with RS485, can go with USB, um, Bluetooth, Wi-Fi. We allowed a lot of uh, communication links, standard ones. And the stand, this, the, those standard ones are one of the key points of a low cost uh, electronics, because if you go to uh, something really specific, then the electronics becomes a, more, a bit more expensive. Then from the software side, as I mentioned, it's, uh, we have this open framework framework in which we can just program a specific protocol under uh, the specifications. So at the end, some customer is interested to say, this is my protocol. We can just uh, uh, sign a no disclosure agreement. They will pass the, the specifications and then we can implement any kind of protocol and software in general. So 
Perfect. Thank you. So that will conclude our session. Um, if you have uh, would like to know more about ITNEO or Delta Q, you can visit the virtual expo booth to learn more about both of our companies. And now if you would like to just make your way through the next session, which is a panel discussion for market trends and battery technology. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you very everybody. much. Bye-bye.